chairman of the Epping Forest Committee. Uh, my Lord Mayor, uh, in reply to the Honourable Member's question, uh, I would inform this Honourable Court... Few people realise that the corporation owns and maintains land outside its own boundaries, which total more than ten times the area of the city itself. The 6,000 acres of Epping Forest are the largest item on the list. Of the half dozen other open spaces which the city holds in trust for the nation, Burnham Beaches is the best known. None of these open spaces is a charge on the city rates. They were acquired and are maintained out of the city's cash, a fund which comes from corporate lands, market tolls and other incidental income. Sometimes for the public good, the city crosses its own frontiers. In other spheres, it may seem strangely jealous of those frontiers. For example, the City of London Police form an island inside the square mile, working with, but not under, Scotland Yard. But there's a reason for this independence. Historically, the watch has been organised by the citizens ever since London was London. And practically, the City Police are a unique body because the city itself is unique. For example, in the tremendous wealth left almost unguarded at night and in the specialised commerce of certain areas. The City of London School for Girls is one of the four famous schools maintained out of the city's cash. It will have a brand new home in the Barbican redevelopment. Although the corporation runs these schools and has seats on the boards of many others, it is not, in law, a local education authority. The Guildhall School of Music and Drama is also one of the four. Next door to both of these is another on the list, an old established boys' public school, the City of London School. The fourth is the City of London Freeman's School at Ashton. So, in education too, the city plays a leading role in supplementing the state educational system. The city's help is not only given to people at the start of their lives. Isledon House, an old people's home in the borough of Islington was acquired by the corporation in 1953. A front door for each flat and a pleasant garden just beyond the back door helped to give the old people both privacy and companionship. Chairman of the Port and City of London Health Committee. My Lord Mayor, the report submitted by my committee to this Honourable Court... The city's health duties, too, extend far beyond the city borders. For the Port of London stretches nearly 70 miles from Teddington to the sea, and its health is the responsibility of the city. The Hygeia, lying at Gravesend, provides for thousands of sailors every year their first contact with both city and port for it is the Port Health Authority's duty to see that incoming vessels do not bring infectious diseases to London. A launch takes the city's boarding medical officer from the Hygeia to visit a newly arrived merchantman. It is the master's duty to present a declaration of health, certifying that there has been no case of infectious sickness during the voyage, or if there has, giving details. Discovered or suspected cases can be promptly removed to hospital in an ambulance launch. The boarding medical officer's job is no mere formality. In fact, it's full-time work for many doctors and inspectors. By their round-the-clock vigilance, they too are fulfilling the city's ancient function of national watchdog in the public interest. There are many other city watchdogs at work in the port for it is not only people who disembark at London. Six and a half million tons of food a year of every possible kind are imported into London. And it's the city's job to see that only what is fit for human consumption is allowed through.
London probably began life as a trading post, so the markets of London are as old as London itself. Smithfield, a renowned marketplace since the 12th century, concentrates on meat, poultry and provisions. Billingsgate is the oldest market belonging to the corporation. It dates at least from the 10th century. Spitalfields in Stepney is the most recently acquired of the corporation's markets. The city bought it in 1901. Fruit and vegetables are its speciality. To all these markets, thousands of tons of goods are brought every day. And for the whole operation, the city is landlord as well as watchdog. The city's achievements in the health sphere would fill a library. Just one more example. It was the first city to become a smokeless zone in the country by Act of Common Council, before Parliament had passed a law on the subject. Watching the corporation on ceremonial occasions, few would guess at the endless day-to-day -day work its job of running the city involves. But even the ceremony is often of national significance. When foreign heads of state come to Britain as guests of the sovereign, a visit to the city is a regular feature of the program. On such occasions, the Lord Mayor may be said to represent the citizens and local authorities of the whole of Britain. The city has always played this dual role, conscious that whatever it does affects the nation. And this is true not merely of ceremony, but also of its daily decisions. A thousand and one aspects of the city's life, problems that stay within its boundaries, and others that reach far beyond, all coming back to these men in the Guildhall. My Lord Mayor, I have great pleasure in seconding the resolution. To agree. On the contrary, the Lord Mayor declares the motion to be carried unanimously. And that is all the business, my Lord Mayor, of which I am aware. Older than kings, older than written history, with roots older than Parliament, and yet always looking to tomorrow, this is the city, the ageless square mile, governed and led, by the mayor, aldermen and commons of the City of London in Common Council Assembly.